Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Hidden Life of the Forest Reserves webinar series. We're so glad you joined us um, and hope you walk away today, with, tonight, with some new information about the history, nature, and people of the forest reserves. Um, also hoping to, to, for you to walk away with some new inspiration to get outdoors and do your part to keep the preserves healthy. Um, and also some ideas uh, for how you can join the Friends of the Forest Preserves community. Um, so I just want to share the results with you real quick of the poll. Um, so we have a good, fairly good mix of um, visitors who go every so often and uh, a nice split between members and non-members. Um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Radhika Moralia. I am the Advocacy and Engagement Director at Friends of the Forest Preserves. Friends unites people to protect, um, promote, and care for the forest preserves in Cook County. As an independent nonprofit organization solely focused on the forest preserves in Cook County, we work tirelessly to safeguard and, and improve the 70,000 acres of forest preserves for all of us and generations to come. We're so glad to connect with you today. Um, though we much prefer hanging out with our community outdoors, uh, we're happy to be able to connect with you in any way we can, um, and certainly a little cooler this way. Uh, we'll be hosting a series of webinars today, like today's, um, starting um, today and continuing over the next few weeks, in which we will zoom in on specific regions of the county to explore, uh, including Spring Creek in the Northwest, that's the webinar is going to be next week. And then the following week, we'll do, um, we'll look at the Calumet region in the south. Um, then we'll be in North Branch in the Northeast. And then um, our final webinar will be about the Palos region in the Southeast. Um, registration information will be available on our, on our website for all of those. A few housekeeping notes before I turn it over to Benjamin. First, I'd like to introduce you to Peter Whitney, who is keeping us on track with te technology today. If you have any issues, you can send him a direct chat that there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so you can choose to send him a direct chat. Um, you could also click on everyone to send everybody a message. Um, and you can use that chat feature as well to ask questions. So if you have a question, we, we really want to hear from you. We're going to save all the questions um, till the end, but you can populate or you can ask your questions in the chat and we'll make sure to get to them at the end. Um, we're going to mute everyone during the presentation. Um, and um, last but not least, just please be aware that this session is being recorded. So I will now mute myself and hand it over to Benjamin Cox, Executive Director of Friends of the Forest Reserves. Enjoy. Hello everyone, it's so great to be here. Hopefully you can hear me well and see me well. This uh, you know, format's a little challenging. It's about, I don't know, I, I've, I've done public presentations. This might be the third one. We've been meeting a lot on Zoom and there's always challenges. So please bear with us. Hopefully we'll get through it. Um, you know, it will be recorded. So you can, you can uh, check it out later. And uh, you know, if you, if you miss something or you wanna go back, or if you're just throw, so enthralled with the great information, this, it'll be available. You can share it with others. Um, I've been here with friends for now for over 16 years now, and it's uh, it's really exciting and great to see how much the organization has changed, but also how much the forest preserves are cha have changed. I was the uh, executive director of one when I got here. I thought it was pretty funny to be in charge of myself only, but in fact, there were many volunteers that had built an excellent foundation in the organization, and many of them are still involved today. Um, so, you know, I started off in a really great place. I was not the founder. Sometimes people think that, but I am not. So, um, it's, uh, it was just excellent to come in and be able to really build something great and have this wonderful community of folks to work with. Um, so I'll go through sort of the history and the, of the forest preserves and all the great and wonderful things about them. And then about friends of the forest preserves, but first we're going to watch a video. Uh, Peter's going to play that for us. Um, for those of you like myself that were had not the best internet connection earlier, the video might be a little glitchy. It's only three minutes, so bear with us. And um, in fact, we'll share the link to it 
uh, in the chat so that maybe if you need to watch it on your own, you can. Um, and then we'll launch into my presentation. don't really know about the forest preserves. They're kind of a uh, wonderful green emerald ring around the city. The forest preserves are owned by the taxpayers and it's about 69,000 acres, 11% of our land. It's a wonderful, wonderful asset. You're out here, you can hear the wind in the trees, you can hear the birds. So it's very, very peaceful. This is one of the oldest forest preserve district in the United States and the largest forest preserve district in the United States. Drive in and set up a picnic, unload your bike, go for a swim at one of our aquatic centers or bring out your fishing pole. All of these things are accessible to everybody for free 365 days a year. Beyond just active recreation is the conservation side of the preserve and the aspect of land management. We're the last bastion in many cases for certain plants and animals that, that really are only found here in the forest preserves of Cook County. Zoonotic disease represents the fastest growing infectious disease in the world today. And about 75% of the new diseases are zoonotic, those that are transmitted from animals to humans. myself working with the forest preserves. It's just so great to see children excited about being outdoors and so that they can learn from a young age because the future of our earth is with the children. this kind of open space so close to a major metropolis is really unheard of. The more people are connected and have an appreciation for it, the more people will want to protect it and even enhance it and even grow it. A lot of people have lost some of their uh, roots of being outdoors. This is something that's a treasure that we need to protect in the long term and that it is of value to them. That video is an intro to a documentary that was run on sort of the second PBS that we used to have in Chicago. Maybe it's even back now, but um, it's something that's available on YouTube. And again, we'll share that link with you uh, in a follow-up video. Uh, or actually, Peter shared it now, and then I'll, I'll send out an email on Friday to all of you, um, and it'll the link will be included in there also. Uh, so here, I am going to share my screen now with any luck, and we'll get started with the presentation. All right, so unless I get a message from Peter saying share your screen or unmute yourself, I should be good. Um, all right, so again, like I said, we're, uh, Benjamin Cox, Executive Director of Friends of the Forest Preserves. I'm going to talk this evening about the Forest Preserves and the, uh, the, the Friends of the Forest Preserves and the history of the two organizations. Um, the that. Again, I spoke to that video and it's a nice documentary you can see later. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why these forest preserves are so amazing, what you can do in them, and then how you can be part of the Friends of the Forest Preserves community. And I know many of you are, already are, and 
again, thank you so much. The Forest Preserves of Cook County uh, was founded just sort of right after the, forest, the, the city of Chicago burned down and there was a, a big plan to um, rebuild the city called the Burnham Plan and the Forest Preserve District was part of that. These folks in the upper left photo are out on a tour at a, a Saturday afternoon walking club where they they go out and, and uh, on trains and get off in the suburbs or then you know just out in the far reaches of the county and, and say look at this wonderful nature we better do something to save it because in a hundred years Chicago will be a place of 10 million people and there won't be any land left. And thank goodness they did because they were right. Um, and you know, here they are dressed up in their top hats and their long dresses so you don't show your ankle, it's a little too risque. Um, and there's some other photos there, you know, coming forward in, in time of, of people out, you know, uh, studying and doing artwork and, and other various uh, wonderful activities that are available. Um, John mentioned in that video, the Forest Preserves of Cook County, it's the first government of its kind in the nation, it's the oldest and the largest. Um, he says it's one of, I say it is the oldest and largest because uh, the concept of the Forest Preserves is unique to Illinois. Uh, the first one in the country was here in Cook County and there's about uh, 15 other similar institutions in the state, you know, the Forest Preserve Districts or Conservation Districts, but um, other states don't have forest preserve districts. They might have state parks, they might have city parks that are somewhat similar, but this idea of a county-based conservation district is pretty unique here. Um, there's some other things that are similar in, you know, LA or, or uh, out in San Francisco and Seattle and some other places, but again, this, the idea of solely committed to conservation uh, is, is unique. And also the forest preserve district is one year older than the National Park Service. There were national parks before the Forest Preserve District, but not the National Park Service that cares for the national parks. The mission is, uh, this is a, you know, kind, of, kind of part of the founding legislation that, that we point to as the mission of the Forest Preserve is to protect, sort of preserve land together with their scenic beauties uh, to, for the education and, and their plants and animals for the uh, education, pleasure and recreation of the public. It's not a park district. It's different than a park district. You know, they're both open space but a park district is generally program space, so mowed grass, you know, ball fields, um, walking paths, those types of things, you know, much more of a, a, a sort of refined space. Forest preserve is 80% natural, uh, and there's 20% that's developed in trails and picnic groves and parking lots and, you know, nature centers and also things like maintenance yards and campgrounds. The, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had the Burnham Plan that said, um, you know, Chicago is the second city not because uh, it's second to New York or something like that, but it's the second time we built it. So in the second go around, we said, let's do it differently. Um, let's, let's make sure we lay this city out with intention and with good planning. And one of the things that was in that great plan was to have uh, parks and boulevards in the city. You can see the little string of islands out in the water that were going to be built. We built one of those, uh, Northerly Island. Uh, otherwise, the rest of them are gone. But um, or the rest of them were never built. There's also uh, uh, then the forest preserves outside of the city. And um, you know, if you look and sort of match up these green spaces, you can see that they they match up fairly well with the plan. This this sort of the northwestern part of the county is not shown on this map, but the other parts, these stretches along rivers, this big portion down in the southwest called Palos, down in the southeast, where actually I wrote a letter of support uh, for the Forest Preserve, where there's, they're working to buy another 80 acres right now. Um, all that stuff is in is in the Forest Preserve district, and, and uh, you know they. It's by far the largest. The other ones in this in the state, the next is you know Lake and DuPage counties are around 30,000 acres. This one is uh, 70,000 acres. As I mentioned, there was sort of this planning that said you know we we better uh, set land aside and otherwise it's all going to be developed. And if you look here, you can see uh, that in the 1800s the green is all natural space, the blue is water, the pink is wetlands, and then the red is the little bit of human development that was here in Cook County at that time. Uh, we fast forward to 2015 and you can see the green that's left almost exclusively is in the forest preserves of Cook County. Uh, and again, thank goodness they, they set that aside. Red is all human development. So I mentioned already, it's nearly 70,000 acres and you know, I always kind of laugh what's an acre and somebody said, oh, it's a football field with the end zones. Okay, 
Uh, but what's 70,000 of those? Well, if you, if you put up all the green bits here together and you've made them one piece of land, it would cover up about half of the city of Chicago. Um, a couple other ways to look at it is that the forest preserves, uh, if they were in our national park system, they'd be right around 42 or 43 out of all the national parks, um, right, uh, right behind um, Teddy Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota, and then right the next one after that is one that pe people probably know a little more, which is Arches National Park. So it's, it's not insignificant. This portion, again, that I referred to earlier in the Southwest called Palos, that's about 15,000 acres. That's the same size as our now second newest national park, the Indiana Dunes National Park, uh, which is also about 15,000 acres. So it just gives you an idea of, of the scale. Um, and there's many other forest reserve districts in the state that aren't as large as even Palos. Another thing that folks don't tend to know is that the Brookfield Zoo and the Chicago Botanic Garden are both on forest preserve district of Cook County land. Um, a portion of your tax dollars go to help fund those institutions. They match the tax dollar contribution many times over. Uh, and they, you know, these are world-class institutions, but um, they are part of the forest preserves of Cook County. They're run by, by separate nonprofits, but there's a, a mutual uh, interest in running them and also, uh, again, funding that's provided. So at the basic level, you know, the, the ecosystems in the forest preserves, that, you know, we're speaking broadly here, woodlands and savanna and wetlands and prairies. Um, there's also rivers and lakes. Um, but the one thing, the one word you don't see here, and I always like to ask this person what, uh, this question when I'm in person presenting to folks, because then I can watch people raise their hands and see who gets it. But, you know, the thing that's not here is forests. There weren't many forests in this region. And what were here were cut down to rebuild the city for the most part. But because of the prairies coming from the west and coming into the um, sort of wetland areas here and the woodlands, um, there just wasn't a lot of forest. There's a lot of fire as part of the ecosystem here that had been uh, around for 10,000 years. Uh, and it was only just the past couple hundred that we've really changed the way everything works. We cut up these natural areas into little pieces. Um, thankfully, we still have them, but the ecosystems function very differently. This is, this is probably one of the, you know, other than the size, the other big takeaway today is to know that this is one of the most biodiverse locations in the whole um, United States and in fact in North America. And what, what does that mean? Well, if you go out into a, a forest preserve at a prairie and you throw down a hula hoop, you might find a few hundred species. If you go out west to one of these wonderful great national parks and you did the same thing, you, you might find a handful of species. You know, they're both wonderful um, and amazing parts of nature that are, that are uh, you know, really a pleasure to enjoy and to, to know that even just, even just to know that they exist, but um, we don't have these giant vistas that you have out west. We have, we have sort of a different kind of appreciation for nature. There's all these ecosystems that come together here at the tip of Lake Michigan uh, that, and we have, you know, a wide variety of, of different things to view and see here in Cook County. And also it's a, a tremendous place for uh, birds as a flyway. They're coming all the way from the tip of South, South America, flying through Chicago and all the way up into um, the far reaches of Canada. Uh, it's, it's just an amazing thing. This slide I always sort of preface by saying it sounds so sad saying, you know, threatened and endangered species. But if you look at it, what it's saying is that more than a hundred species, threatened and endangered species, find refuge in the forest preserve. So, uh, they, they actually exist here because the forest preserves exist. They're, they have a place to call home. And if you notice, a lot of the rest of the state doesn't have much at all, and that's because most of it was plowed under. The prairie state has very little prairie left. Thankfully, there's lots of pockets of it here in Cook County and in the surrounding counties, and then way down south, there's uh, some good nature in the uh, Shawnee National Forest. But, um, you know, another interesting stat that I learned recently was that the actually the amount of prairie in the state is actually going up because there's lots of restoration and care going on uh, in different natural areas in the state. We're actually able to regain some of that space. Here's just a few of the critters that, that call uh, Cook County home. Uh, you know, Illinois has the um, largest number of bald eagles out of any state in the lower 48 states. So Alaska, you know, beats us by far. But after that, Illinois, uh, actually home to the most bald eagles. There's river otters, they were extirpated 
uh, in Cook County and in fact in the state or most of the state and they've returned and they're amazing creatures. If you ever have the opportunity to see uh, the wildlife biologist for the Forest Preserve, uh, Chris Anker's presentation on river otters is just unbelievable. Um, they, are, they are really intelligent, smart and voracious critters. They'll clear every um, living thing out of a pond and go on to the next one and do it to the next one. And I guess nature's wonderful because those places repopulate, but um, these river otters, they travel far and they're, they're really just amazing, wonderful creatures. On the left is one of my favorites, the Blanding's turtle. And then uh, that requires large amounts of open space. And thankfully some of the forest preserves are big enough to support them. And then you have the black crown night, night heron down on the bottom right. There's a quite a, we, you know, most of us know the um, great blue heron, and this is just one of the other species of heron that call Cook County home. Some of my favorite creatures are by far reptiles and amphibians. Uh, here I am holding a little leopard frog found in that, in that uh, little pool there. And then a top, in the top photo there, I'm holding a salamander incorrectly. I will note the person on the bottom right is doing it correctly, uh, you know, trying to protect that critter from their hand by having it on leaves. Now it crawled off onto their hand, so that's not great, but their skin's very porous and they can absorb things from your skin. So really the best thing to do uh, if you want to find or see salamanders is you can look under logs and that type of thing and just take a peek and gently put the log back and let them stay right where they're at. Um, but there's this blue spotted salamander uh, is, is found throughout Cook County. And then of course there's lots of snakes and uh, turtles and legless lizards and all kinds of other wonderful creatures here. I mentioned earlier that one of the key purposes of the forest preserve is uh, recreation. And uh, it's, a, you know, it's a vital reason. People are part of nature and whether you're sitting in your home, um, you're still breathing air and drinking water or if you're out actually in the woods, just a ton of ways to get out into the forest preserves and really enjoy them. You know, there's more than 300 miles of marked trails, uh, 200 picnic groves. The trails are by far the most popular use of the forest preserve and a quick second is picnic groves. There's many families that have been having family reunions in the picnic groves for generations, decades and decades. Uh, six nature centers, 40 fishing lakes that are all stocked with fish each year. Five campgrounds, which were closed in this administration uh, under Tony Preckwinkle and Arnold Randall, have reopened them, thankfully. Uh, ten golf courses, but then you have all this other, you know, biking and birding and boating, and I could go on and on. This map on the right is a water trails map, so it shows you where you can put in and put in your canoe uh, or your kayak and paddle. You, you know, one of the easiest places actually is through downtown Chicago. There's not a lot of obstructions, but this map also shows you places where you might need to portage and other places where you can uh, take out your canoe or your, your boat. One of my favorite spots to go hiking is down in the Palos region. Again, I've mentioned that place a few times because it's, uh, it's really a neat uh, chunk of the forest preserves. It's large. Um, it actually has hills. Uh, a lot of the terrain there is, is the result of the glaciers and the glacial activity that left things like uh, an asker that's found there. I'll talk more about that in a second. But, um, I'm going to speak specifically as a suggestion of this great yellow trail down here. You can see uh, in the green, you have the, uh, that darker green and there's a little triangle and that red thing's a cardinal actually. And what that says is that area is special, that it has an extra designation from the state of Illinois as an Illinois nature preserve. So it's at such high quality nature that it gets this extra designation and this extra level of protection. Um, it's available for you to go out and hike in. And a couple years ago, uh, here we are standing on the Esker Trail there in, in Palos. Um, and Esker is kind of a serpentine uh, uh, tract of land that's a hill that's left behind by a glacial river that was running under the glacier and dumping material under there and forming this beautiful uh, um, glacial feature there in, in Palos, in uh, Capsauer's Holdings. Um, one day, the, a group of us went and hiked. Um, we, we started at Teasons Woods. In fact, both of these hikes, I started at Teasons Woods, which is just across the road uh, from Cap Sowers. And one day we hiked over nine miles. And then another time I went out and in preparation for a, a hike that we've done, I, I hiked about, I mean, another tour that I led here for friends in person uh, was just over three miles. And you can see I had to do some double back, you know, some uh, switch back, recover, recovering ground because I could I lost the trail for a minute. So. Um, you can go out, you can follow the yellow trail. You can also, if you really want to know about how to get out to, to the Esker, 
feel free. I'll send you my email on Friday. Um, you can reach out and I'll let you know how to get there and, and uh, give you an idea of how to get back. Um, the nice thing is, you know, the, the, one of the benefits of these smaller spaces is if you ever got lost, just walk in the same direction for a few minutes and you'll end up on a road. You'll be okay. But uh, if you want a little bit of an adventure, I can help you with that here at Caps Hours. Okay, so why Friends of the Forest Preserves? We've got this great and wonderful institution. Why do we need this nonprofit attached to it or working uh, alongside of it? You know, as Radhika mentioned, we, the Friends community unites people to protect, promote, and care for the forest preserves in Cook County. We do that in many different ways. Um, we were formed because in the late 90s, there were a lot of things happening that weren't very good. The forest preserve had lost its way over the decades um, and really kind of lost its focus. Uh, it had some big financial problems. Um, there, was a re there was a moratorium on volunteering in the forest preserve, so some folks that didn't like having the the green wall of brush cut behind their homes so that then you can see the road through there uh, on the other side of the forest preserve. You know, they, they had political pull and we did not. And we realized that if we wanted to have any kind of influence, we needed to form a friends group. And we needed to make sure that the politicians knew that there were enough of us and we were a united voice that could speak out for this nature and for the people that love it and use it. The other thing that happened is there on the bottom right, that's uh, forest preserve on the right and the Donald R. Kitt Stevens Convention Center on the left. And that used to be forest preserves under about two acres of that. It's a little more than two acres of the convention center. Legally, that's not supposed to be able to happen. Once, as taxpayers, we purchase land and set it aside in forest preserve, it's supposed to be there for uh, generations to come. And because no one was really watching and there was some political shenanigans and anybody in those Rosemont knows you know, what else goes on because it's Rosemont, uh, or at least what it used to go on. Um, they had, again, they had the pull and we didn't have the pull to stop them. So we started Friends of the Forest Preserves. Uh, we did a two part study on the Forest Preserve District released uh, in 2002 that talked about the great and wonderful history, talked about all the challenges uh, that the Forest Preserves faced and then made uh, extensive recommendations on how to improve the Forest Preserves. That really set the foundation for the organization to grow. We did it in partnership with Friends of the Parks, the Sierra Club, Audubon, and a few other organizations. Uh, and it really said, okay, we, you know, it really told us that we needed a full-time Friends of the Forest Preserves organization. As soon as I got to work here, uh, you know, I had a voicemail box and a checking account and people are like, go to these meetings on the land policy. It hasn't been updated since the 1960s. We need to do that. We need to protect against these land grabs. So right off the bat in 2004, that's, that's what I got to work on. And with the commissioners and a number of other organizations, we were, to, we were able to update that land policy that's really helped protect the land ever since. That's the kind of policy and advocacy work that we do at Friends. Um, we also do things like uh, organize people, like these young women, to, these young ladies to come out and speak uh, in support of the forest preserves. There I am at the top right at the microphone there in the, at the county boardroom, Brenda Elmore, one of our uh, long-term uh, Conservation Corps members. And what our, our senior uh, leader manager for the Conservation Corps is there presenting, speaking in support of the preserves. And again, there's one of the young women, uh, young ladies, <laughs> girls, I should say, uh, that volunteers in the preserves, but also came down uh, and was able to speak in support of the Forest Preserves in front of the Forest Preserve Board. You know, Friends is an organization that likes to get things done. We don't just uh, bark at the door. We like to say we work at the table. Uh, we're invited to the table. We often have great influence and are able to do that because of our members and because of the community that we've built over the years and the partnerships. Um, the left there, there's a pipe at a great forest reserve called Ted Stone in Hodgkins, kind of just a little north of that Palos chunk on LaGrange Road. Um, and this pipe was dumping so much water into the forest the adjacent shopping mall that it was actually eroding itself away. I, I won't go into the details of the hydrology there, but suffice it to say, it was doing great damage to the forest preserve, not only uh, eroding it away, sending it off to, uh, you know, uh, Illinois River and the Mississippi River and eventually the Gulf of Mexico, but um, it was also bringing hot, oily, polluted water into the preserves. And we were able to work together with a couple of other organizations. There's uh, Alice Brandon there. She was working for Friends of the Parks at the time. Uh, Doug Chen, who was working for the Sierra Club. Uh, we were able to work with folks up at uh, Northwestern and the Kent College of Law and Northwestern Engineering students and Kent College Law students to 
bring a solution to the table that works both for the forest reserve, but also for that adjoining uh, shopping mall and the village. And they liked our, our solution so much that it was implemented and now that forest reserve is healing and is in much better shape and the polluted water is not dumping into it any longer. Top right there is Bobian Woods. There was a huge dumping issue there of actual materials. Uh, there's a, 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 a landfill nearby where you can drive in and pay a fee to dump the kitchen and bathroom project you've got, or you can dump at the Forest Preserve for free. Um, we cleaned that up and very early on again when I was here at Friends, uh, like two, 2005, 2006, we filled up two 40 yard dumpsters. Those are those really big ones that you see at construction sites. We filled those with completely full with material. Uh, we pulled five cars out of that preserve and 151 tires. Uh, we had a lot of great support to get that done and now it's a much cleaner place. Um, and then the bottom right is a whole nother kind of dumping that was going on. Dumping has been a challenge for the forest preserve since it started and it still continues now, but this one was special in that uh, it was sort of um, being allowed by forest preserve workers that weren't really being overseen closely enough. Um, this area was closed off it's at Miller Meadow across from uh, uh, Loyola Hospital out in the west suburbs. Um, so we had a whole chunk of forest reserve that not only was destroyed, but it was no longer available to the public. We helped get that fence removed. We helped get the land restored. Uh, in fact, there's now a walking trail there. Um, it's not restored the way it really ought to be, but it is back to a functioning uh, ecosystem and it's providing habitat for birds and insects. And then also, again, it's open to the public and available for all of us to enjoy. A big focus of our work is habitat restoration. Uh, invasive species are a huge problem in the forest preserves. It's something that kind of snuck up on all of us and we've been working on it now for about 40 years and we're actually making great progress. Um, you can see here in 2011, at Dalton Avenue Prairie in Southeast Cook County, there's the before and after photo of uh, conservation corps members going in um, we, Friends runs very large conservation corps programs uh, with young people and adults doing work in the preserves. And you can see this sort of monoculture of brush on the left and then on the right, once that was cleared out, this is the same spot where now you can see uh, just two years later, a diversity of species coming back. Why is that important? Each one of those species has, has a purpose in the ecosystem. It's part of a whole food web. It's, it supports um, a variety, you know, each plant has uh, species that it hosts that then uh, other species rely on for their food or, or even us, you know, there's, there's pollinators that rely on these kinds of places. Um, and here's another one at Sand Ridge Nature Center, not too far from Dalton Avenue Prairie, the same kind of situation. 2009, there's a wall of brush, we clear it out, uh, replant some seeds, do some follow-up work with, uh, you know, earth, uh, invasives if they try and, you know, make a comeback and there you can already see a diversity of species coming back. Mentioned a little bit about our conservation corps. We have adult conservation corps members. This, right now we've got 25 adults and actually I think we've creeped it up to about 28 at this moment, uh, working out in the preserves uh, 36 hours a week year round, even today in that wonderful heat. They start real early in the morning and they try and end as early as they can in the afternoon. Um, lots of water breaks, but uh, and then on the, on the right there, we have our summer high school interns. We have two high school programs. We'll have about 200 total members out uh, between the two programs, or the three, you know, the adult core and the two uh, high school programs this summer. Uh, so the ranks of friends really swell in the summer. Uh, there's two paid programs where kids are paid a, an hourly wage, um, not just a stipend, but a real hourly wage. And one program is five weeks and one six weeks. And uh, if you're interested in those, please reach out or check out our website. Uh, the applications uh, open in January and February for those programs. We also do a lot of volunteer organizing. Uh, it's really an important role here in the forest preserves. It's volunteers that have been caring for sites like Jane Balaban there in the top left has been working on uh, some sites along the North branch of the Chicago river for more than 40 years with her husband, John. A lot of times if I say John Balaban, people know him because he was their teacher at uh, St. Ignatius High School. Um, but, you know, there's other folks in other groups, like, but down, uh, you know, throughout the county where we're trying to foster new groups, we're trying to recruit new volunteers. Um, people go out and help remove invasive species, spread seeds. There's also a lot of volunteer opportunities if you want to be a trail watch person to help sort of 
keep an eye out uh, for any challenges on the trail, help people know how to use them correctly, um, help give people information about, you know, good hikes and, and other ways to enjoy the preserves uh, appropriately. There's a number of other volunteer opportunities, both with friends and with the forest preserves. So if you're interested, please reach out, we can get you connected. Some of the other work we do is we, uh, we will raise funds to hire contractors to do work. So there's actually ecological restoration contractors. So just like you might have a landscaper, these guys work on natural areas. And on the top left there, that's actually Dan Ryan Woods by uh, my house on the south side of Chicago. That's a longtime volunteer, Larry Unruh, and we're working with contractors to do some restoration work on a ravine there. Where we cleared all the invasives, we planted native seeds, and then we held them in place with this erosion control blanket, which once it rained, it stuck to the ground and helped the seeds grow on these steep ravines. Uh, I can tell you today, if you went out there, you'd see that these ravines that were had bare ground with just invasive shrubs sticking out of them are now covered in native species. And the erosion has been stopped, and it's, it's just a much... Uh, healthier and uh, native uh, environment there. Friends of the Forest Preserves also will engage contractors to do prescribed burns, like here on the, in the bigger picture. Uh, the Forest Preserve District does prescribed burns. You've probably heard about them some on the news. Uh, prescribed burning is intentional. It's done very carefully. It's done by trained uh, people. And even as a volunteer, you can do it. I've, I've uh, been involved in hundreds of prescribed burns. It's a lot of fun. You're not supposed to say that because fire is dangerous, but as long as you're actually uh, trained and paying attention and doing the right thing, you know that you're doing a tremendous uh, service to the ecosystem uh, by going out and helping to implement prescribed burns. It's also a very inexpensive restoration tool, so it's, it's terribly important. Again, if you'd like more info on that, please reach out. Um, and then we have a whole engagement department of friends are the ones helping us run this webinar today. Um, they're also the ones that help recruit volunteers, uh, but also we we do some we have some fun events and tours. Uh, COVID-19 is sort of slowing us down on those this year, so we're doing more things like this online. But you know we'll have bird walks and other uh, plant ID tours. Um, we also have a really fun event called Beer in the Woods. It happens in September. We're going to do a virtual version of that this year, but uh, next year I'm, hopefully we'll be back. We have live animals, uh, about 30 breweries. Um, there's some bird tours and other fun, uh, you know, event or activities that you can participate in there. We have DJ, and it's just a lot of fun to be out in the woods, uh, actually enjoying a fall afternoon, um, seeing some native uh, animals, but also interacting with other members of the Friends community. Um, you can see <laughs> my friend Margaret there, her Maggie, uh, really having a good time uh, with that. Possum, the much maligned opossum, North America's only marsupial. They eat tons of ticks and they're really sweet creatures actually. And they're very soft. So if you ever get a chance to meet one, you should take advantage of that. Okay, here's all of my contact info. Again, I'll send you an email on Friday. Uh, there's also, uh, and actually, you know, if you reach out, I do respond. I'm not big and fancy. This, you know, we're, we're uh, uh, you know, a grassroots nonprofit. We're very much uh, here to facilitate uh, this community and the community is really what gets things done, not just us staff at the office, uh, but all of us together working out the preserves and helping to spread the word about how wonderful they are. Um, so again, you know, feel free to reach out. There's my email, there's our office phone. Um, if you call the office phone and get my voicemail box, you're going to hear my cell phone number. Call that because I'm not going to the office these days thanks to COVID. Uh, feel free to call my cell phone. There's all these different forms of social media for you to connect with. Um, and I would be a terrible executive director. I encourage you to be a member of Friends if you're not. And please feel free to check out our website and uh, sign up to be a member. You'll get um, invites to events like these and our other fundraising events, but also lots of good information on the Forest Preserves, and you'll get to be part of this wonderful community uh, helping to support and improve them. Thank you, um, the young lady again out actually volunteering. Um, and I think now I will stop sharing so that Radhika can um, help facilitate some questions. Um, I am used to doing this presentation in person where people ask lots of questions and that sort of helps guide the presentation. So please feel free to, to uh, ask away and I'd be happy to do my best to answer your questions or get back to you with an answer via email. 
Okay, so yeah, I will take questions. Um, if you pop them into the chat, I will um, just kind of help moderate um, and ask them uh, to Benjamin. Uh, if you think of something after, after the fact, um, please do reach out and ask us questions at any time. Um, so Benjamin, one question is, how does land become a part of the forest preserves? The Forest Preserve Desk District has actually done an amazing job of buying land over the years, and they have a really great plan that, that sort of identifies opportunities. Now, currently, most of those opportunities, you know, like all of them are owned by someone, right? There's no land out there that's sort of just available for them to go and, and get. And a lot of that land is not actually for sale, but they know where they want to be. And they, uh, they work with folks often to kind of figure out how to, to make acquisitions. So right now they're working on buying uh, those 80 acres that I mentioned are along, uh, along a thing called North, uh, North Creek, which is, you know, kind of in the south, west, uh, eastern part of the county. Again, 80 acres, that's actually a pretty big chunk to be able to buy. Um, so literally the Forest Preserve buys the land and once they buy it and the, the county, the Forest Preserve commissioners vote to make it a Forest Preserve, it becomes part of the system. Um, the, they, this administration has done a really good job of spending all of their land acquisition funds. So they have to do a lot of work to work with uh, homeowners or landowners to either donate land or they're working very hard to get grants at this time to be able to, to purchase land. I hope that answers your question. So a little bit of follow-up question. Are there many opportunities to buy land from retired farms in the suburbs? There are, and that's by far, that's the, I think that's their most, uh, that, that's the biggest opportunity area is farms. Um, you know, we say, oh, once it's been changed to something else, it can't be changed back. It's actually not true. The Forest Preserve, not only a lot of the land is farmland, but uh, even now, most of what they buy is farmland. The other thing that we've seen is in Westchester, for example, they bought a subdivision kind of piece by piece together with the state and have been converting it back to Forest Preserve land because it, these homes were on five or 10 acre parcels. They're on some of the best black soil prairie left in east of the Mississippi River. Uh, and they knew it was important to try and, and uh, preserve that land. And so slowly but surely they've been buying the land together with the homes. Okay. Which forest preserve contains the most prairie land? Which, which actual forest preserve or which Forest Preserve District. That's a hard question. Um, maybe, maybe Linda wants to go visit, wants to see some amazing yeah, yeah. prairie. Where should she go? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, you know, pretty much anywhere in the county, there's a good prairie to go see. Um, so if you're down in the southeast, there's actually a lot of prairie. Uh, Sand Ridge, uh, Powderhorn is an amazing place with uh, it's it's a dune and swale prairie with legless lizards and cactus. Um, you can head out uh, in Orland. There's a, a over a thousand acre parcel that's almost all prairie. It's in restoration, so some of it's really great. Some of it still needs work, but uh, it's under you know it's it's moving right along. Um, Palos has some really great prairies. You can go up Ted Stone, where I'd mentioned on Lagrange Road. You can go up to the north suburbs. Uh, some of the best examples of prairie left again are up there. The folks have been working on those as volunteers since the 1970s. And then if you head out uh, west and northwest, um, you get into Spring Creek and Poplar Creek. And again, if, if, you, uh, if you emailed me and said, where are you looking, you know, where are you really looking to be? Uh, or, you know, where do you live? I could some great spots for you. Um, so yeah. And again, you can volunteer to help those places if you'd like. It's a lot of fun. It's great exercise. And there's a lot to learn and great communities at these places. If somebody is inspired to volunteer, Benjamin, what should they do? They should email us and they can, you can email Peter or Radhika. The nice thing about friends is our emails are just our first name at the acronym for Friends of the Forest Preserves, so FOTFP.org. Um, you could also visit the Forest Preserves website and uh, just pop in Forest Preserves of Cook County Volunteering and you'll, they'll take you right to the, uh, a great uh, page where, that we actually had a heavy hand in getting them to get and they've improved it dramatically since we first pushed them to do it, but they have a great web presence for volunteering. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of ways to get involved. I 
I saw a question about bison and it's, it's critters and those are my favorite animals are my favorite thing. So I can't miss it. The forest preserves of Cook County have not thought about reintroducing bison. They need a lot of land. There are some, and your person asking probably knows this, but there's, there are some places here in, in Northeast Illinois and actually just west of here some too, where they have reintroduced bison. We're figuring out that bison are a key part of the ecosystem, but you better have plenty of space for them. They're big critters and they need a lot of room. Uh, but you can't, you can go down to Medewin just southwest of Cook County and, and see them. It's uh, National Tallgrass Prairie there. You can head out to some Nature Conservancy properties at Nuchusa Grassland way out west and you can see bison there also. The, the, neither one of these places is very far away for any of us if you live in Cook County. So. So staying on the topic of uh, critters, which animals are unique to Cook County? I saw that question fly by. I don't know that I can answer that question. Um, I don't know if anything's particularly unique, but again, I think I'd want to ask that question of forest preserve ecologists or biologists to really answer that for you. Um, there are some things that really persist here that just aren't found much in other places. And, you know, there's some really unique things. There's lizards, for example, people wouldn't think there are, but there are. And there's a thing called a legless lizard, which looks like a snake, but if you're used to looking at snakes and lizards like I am, it, you can see that it's a lizard without legs. It's not actually a snake. Um, lots of uh, other really special turtles. Um, there's actually a rattlesnake in Cook County that scientists can't even find because they're so reclusive. Uh, it's called the Massasauga rattlesnake. Some rattlesnakes are, you know, a little bit more involved and aggressive than others. This one is very not aggressive. Um, it can be found in a couple places in the county. Again, river otters and uh, I could go on and on. Someone mentioned deer there. There's plenty of deer. Um, one of the challenges with deer is that we um, got rid of all the species here that would have helped control deer population. And I always like to mention that one of the most important controls of deer, human beings are no longer doing that in Cook County. Uh, you know, for 10,000 years or, or, you know, maybe a little less, there were people here hunting deer and now we don't do that here. And so there's a, uh, we've really altered the ecosystem here. So deer are a little bit of a challenge. There's a good woodland in a forest, okay. Uh, a woodland, okay, so if you start with prairie and go all the way to forest, it's all about the amount of tree cover. Uh, so a prairie should have none. A savanna, which is uh, without an H, is the way we spell it here in the Midwest, because it's a little bit of a different ecosystem than the ones you might find in Africa. Uh, should have just a little bit of tree cover, maybe some shrubs. Uh, you get to a woodland, it's more like 50%, 50 to 80% tree cover. And once you get above, um, 90%, that's when you're really in a forest. The, the way that we know these things, it's not just the trees, it has a lot to do with the other species that uh, find refuge in these places. And, they, and we, know, um, we know that uh, those species are a key part of the ecosystems that make up those, these things that we now have put labels on and calling them forests or prairies or uh, woodlands. But uh, Illinois woodland, there's the last thing I'll say about it is if you're driving by a forest preserve and you can see in and you see flowers and grasses on the ground and you can see through the trees and see quite a quite a distance you know that's a healthy woodland uh i'm gonna ruin the forest preserve experience for some folks now by saying if you drive by one and it's a wall of green that is most likely a basis species you should be able to see in there even in a prairie you should be able to see late in the summer the prairie will be so tall that it's a little bit harder to see through and that's just because it's amazing but uh, yeah, if you're driving by a wall of green, uh, you know, it's probably buckthorn or some other invasive species that you're seeing. Um. So Benjamin, we have a question that leads uh, well into this next question about what type of activities volunteers do. So if you're an ecological restoration volunteer, you're out helping to cut brush uh, and seeds and plant seeds. Um, and there's many sort of specialized roles for an ecological restoration volunteer. So you can, you can be the person that helps with the tools or acts or works on the newsletter. Um, I had a woman in my group that never actually came out to the preserve, but she made the calls to volunteers each month to remind them that the volunteer day was coming on Saturday. She was actually uh, uh, homebound in a wheelchair, but she could still help volunteer. So 
Um, there's a lot of really great ways to be involved. Um, you can, again, you can also help volunteer through the Forest Preserve District more directly. Uh, again, those Forest Preserve, if you're doing ecological restoration, you are a, a Forest Preserve volunteer and you should be registered within the system there. You can learn how to do prescribed burns or chainsaw work and all kinds of other things. Um, there's volunteers that do, uh, that are monitors. So they might be dragonfly monitors or frog monitors, plants of concern. Um, there's a lot of different species that you can help track and, and uh, contribute um, citizen science data to, to help preserve them and enhance them. But also um, you can be, I mentioned earlier, a trail watch volunteer. Uh, there's nature center volunteers and it, it goes, it goes on from there. So uh, we also have volunteer board members. A couple of them joined us here on this call tonight. Um, and you can, you, you can serve on friends board. You could be a volunteer uh, helping us with our events each year. Uh, we, we're just really getting going uh, with having volunteers involved with those. And that's a bunch of fun. So it really depends what to do. Um, I started, there was a, I, I was reading through some of the applicants that didn't get the job and one in particular was handed to me and said, pay attention to this person. Uh, she said I don't, in her cover letter, I don't want the job, but I want to help you once you figure out who's going to do this job. And she was then a volunteer staff member at the office for uh, many years with a regular schedule and regular responsibilities. Eventually, she became a paid staff person and uh, really helped uh, build our membership program. And now we have more than 2,000 members of Friends. Okay, I saved the big one, the, the big question for last. What is the one of the biggest challenges to the forest preserves or protecting the forest preserves? Yeah, I mean, it's people. And it's the mus misuse of the forest preserves by people. Um, and there's, you know, the best thing, we want as many people out enjoying the forest preserves as possible. And it's just important that we all know how to do it. And there's a couple quick things that can really help protect them. One, Stay on trails. You're allowed to walk anywhere in the forest preserves. It's better if you stay on the trails. Um, if the trail's muddy, you know, if it's wet outside, wear the right shoes to walk right through that mud. If you're walking through the edges, you actually are making the trail wider and wider and wider, and you're taking out, um, you know, really uh, special, um, you know, plants and animals there that, that uh, just by making that trail wider and you're physically eroding the, the forest preserve away. Um, please don't take anything home. It's not legal and it's bad for the ecosystem. Each one of those plants and animals and even uh, a skull or a flower is part of the ecosystem and it really is an important part of what makes a forest preserve different than a park. It, you know, these are ecosystems, they're, they're uh, chunks of nature, native nature that's been here forever. And uh, it's really important for us to protect them and help them stay there. Um, and the biggest one that anybody can help with is that people just don't know what they are. They don't know what forest preserves are and it's, people don't think about the size and shape of their county. Why would they? Um, you might maybe notice on a sign or kind of know when you go to some other place, you're in a different county, but what difference does that make? Um, the difference it makes here is that we have, you know, in Chicago and the suburbs, we have these great, wonderful cultural institutions, amazing food, uh, you know, in fact, world-class food, maybe some of the best food in North America. Uh, you know, we have amazing sports teams and theater, and we should all say, and forest preserves. People, when they fly in at night, they notice these giant chunks of forest preserves that are, you know, uh, they see just huge chunks of the land that are black, and that's forest preserves. It's dark. Um, we see that grid system of lights, you know, that Chicago's famous for, and then these big open spaces. And folks that notice will ask, what are those things? And you say, well, this is a, this amazing nature. Um, you know, it's something we should be very proud of and that we should be promoting. Um, if you're a young person looking for a job and wanting to get your life started, you might pick a place because of nature on top of the jobs that are available or the food and the theater. So why don't we promote the forest preserves also and know that they're a key part of our uh, key part of our community, that nature is really an important part of our lives. Um, so I could go on and on and on and I, <laughs> I kind of do, but uh, you know, if you need more ammunition, I can help you out. Um, yeah. It's Thank you. Yeah, that's a good note to end on. Um, but as Benjamin mentioned, if you have any follow up questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. We love talking directly with our community members um, and helping to problem solve or point you in the right direction or answer your questions. Um, so uh, thanks again. For
joining us. We hope to see you in the field sometime soon. Volunteering but with uh, Illinois Progression, we'll be able to invite more and more people out to the preserves. Um, but keep uh, stay in touch with us through email, social media, um, our website. We have four more webinars in the series coming up every Wednesday evening through August 5th. Um, and uh, if you feel inspired to join us as a member or make any donation donation to support our work, Peter will pop a tip jar link into the chat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us. All right, take care everybody.